Welcome to Dragon's Den, a place where, for the fortunate few, business and pleasure do mix, but for those who fail to convince, it could be a painful experience. <laughs> First to face the dragons are Lee Denny and Julia Lowe. Deep breath in, deep breath out. Go. Every would-be scout knows the importance of being prepared. And Lee and Julia have spent a decade in muddy fields as groundwork for today. We'd both been working in festivals and music for 10 years, and we were trying to think of an entirely new experience that gave people the chance to come away with more than just a hangover. Oh, it looks great. Looks like my cup of tea, whatever it is. I'd so love to do that. Unfortunately, having suffered a fractured wrist, Deborah Meaden will just have to park the pottery dream for now. But that doesn't stop her from being the entrepreneur's favoured dragon. I would really like to work with Deborah Meaden. I'm hearing the music from Ghost. <laughs> what is it, Unchained Melody? Yes. <laughs> Just close your eyes and imagine, Deborah. She's got a really great background in holiday camps and her ethics just seem really, really aligned with what we do. Hi, I'm Julia Lowe. And I'm Lee Denny. And we are the founders of Camp Wildfire, the UK's first summer camp for adults. We are offering a 5% stake in our business in return for a £75,000 investment. At Camp Wildfire, you adventure by day and you party by night. Your ticket includes a choice of over 100 activities and 50 bands and DJs. You'll spend your days driving quad bikes, firing arrows, climbing trees and building rafts. And as night falls, you'll feast on banquets, party in the forest and cosy up around campfires. This year, we have two sold-out events and are about to launch a third. We will turn over 1.8 million and anticipate net profits of 315,000. So we'd just like to say thank you to Matt. He's just showing you one of the examples of the kind of activities you can do at Camp Wildfire. We'd also like to thank Danny. We have a cocktail-making workshop at the event. He's going to bring you a cocktail now. Summer Camps for Adults is the brainchild of Lee Denny and Julia Lowe. Everybody at Camp Wildfire gets given an enamel mug on the way in. Thank you very much. Uh, this is so we don't have to use any disposable plastics. They're seeking a £75,000 investment in return for 5% of their company. And it appears Sarah Davies is quite taken with the idea of daytime adventures and nighttime partying. Hey guys, this sounds <laughs> brilliant. I was actually going to ask you about your target market and the demographic that you're hitting. So m most people coming tend to be aged 30 to 45. It tends to be people that have been to a couple of festivals before. Now they want something a little bit more engaging. They want to go away having learned some new skills and feeling really good about themselves. So what does it cost me for an individual ticket for the weekend? We have three different ticket prices. We have an elementary ticket, which is £245. Mm -hmm. That comes with 60 activity credits and all the kind of bands and DJs. A standard ticket, that's 295 and that comes with 120 activity credits. And then we have a dynamo version, which comes with unlimited activity credits. And last question from me, how do I book on have you still got any availability <laughs> this year? Yes. We can sort you out. <laughs> an activity-packed weekend under canvas could be just the ticket for Sarah Davies. Deborah Meaden now wants to arm herself with the Dapper Duo's financials. I've never seen grown-ups look so good in their scout outfits, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let's talk about some numbers. Do you want to take me through what you've already done, then? We were established in 2015. Between 2015 and 2019, we were making net losses of around 10 to 20,000 per year. That's normal for an event brand. It takes three, five years to, to get going and to get to that break even point. Really excitingly for us, 2019, 2020 financial year, we'd sold out 2,000 tickets. Uh, we'd turned over 600,000 or would have turned over 600,000. We would have made a 100,000 pound profit. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we weren't able to run our events that year. 
Uh, we've managed to come back stronger this year. We've already sold 1.3 million's worth of tickets, and we should make 315,000 net profit. So what does the balance sheet look like? As of today, I don't know, because we're still working out all the COVID losses. I know, I know, it's been a really tough year. Yeah, because it's a tough year is the very year you should be on it. When it's tough and things are going wrong, you've got to be all over your numbers. Yeah. Some in-depth dragon delving reveals that the event planning pair have a shaky grasp of their current festival's finances. Now, Stephen Bartlett wants to find out more about the man and woman beneath the badges. What are your backgrounds? So my background is in graphic design. That's actually how Lee and I met. So Lee was running festivals for many years and I was his graphic designer. Yeah, um, I started my first festival business at the age of 16 in my back garden when my parents went away on holiday. And they said, you're not allowed to have a house party. So me and my friends had a festival instead. That festival ran for 10 years and was very successful. And you sold it or? It was actually run as a non-profit festival. So me and my friends started it primarily to support music in our local area. And then it just kind of kicked off. It grew to about 2,500 attendees over the course of 10 years. Um, uh, but we were all working on it voluntarily. So it just kind of ran its course. Uh, and then, then we closed down the company. We gave all the money to charity. Um, yeah, and how much was it? How much did you give? Sorry, uh, I think some years we made a loss, so we didn't actually end up uh, being able to give money to charity. Other years we gave four or five thousand pounds. So that was basically a, a festival and a business, but it didn't make any money and you just closed it? Well, I think because we couldn't get the ticket prices high enough um, to compete on lineup with a lot of the big guys. Whereas with this, this is completely unique, which is why people are willing to pay a premium ticket price for it. But the thing is, you haven't, you haven't done this yet, have you? We yes, have. We've run it for five years. Yeah. In 2015 was our first event. So you got five years to 19, and specifically on that year, how much net profit? Net loss, 10,000. OK, then you have the pandemic. Your hands are tied. Yep. And now this year, yes, you've taken people's money, mm -hmm. yep. but you still haven't run a festival, still haven't made money. So right up until now, you haven't demonstrated that you can run a festival and make money. Um, is that fair statement? I guess, yeah, that's a fair statement. I'm giving you a hard time because you've come in at a £1.5 million valuation just because you've sold tickets to an event you haven't done yet. We have done it. Well, you haven't? Yeah, not this year, but... We haven't done it this year. In the year that you did do it, you lost money. From where I'm sitting, I just don't see this as a business opportunity. So, for that reason, I'm out. Ticket sales for future events aren't enough to satisfy Peter Jones, who decamps from the deal. While a luxury-loving Tuka Suleiman has a confession to make. Guys, I've never been camping. Have you not? Never. No! Wow. So, first it comes into my mind is, do I get a shower, bed, ensuite? What do you offer for the money you're receiving? So with your ticket comes a, a space in our general camping, which is free. Right. Or we have other options. So there's a pre-pitched tent camping, which is a slightly more expensive on top of your ticket. We have holiday camping, which is vintage uh, frame tents. Yeah. Or there's boutique camping, which is the proper beds, the bell tent, you know, the whole shebang. So yeah. that's I would have thought I'd read one of these big vans, all luxury. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. You can do that as well. Oh, right. You could also hire somebody as well, too, to do the activities yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> so how many people do you have on each event? 2,000. It's not intimate. I can see myself coming down to your camp, one look and I'm out of there. <laughs> 2,000 people, that would drive me crazy. This is a business for somebody that knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. This is not a product where you ring up a, a retailer and say, we want to get your product in. It's very different. And for that reason, I'm out. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Lee, Julia, when I look at the concept that you presented today, it doesn't get me, like, tremendously excited. And I find that difficult as an investment because I wouldn't want to come. And I think you need an investor that would want to be there swinging on your zip lines and making your pots. Unfortunately, that's not me. And for that reason, I'm going to say that I'm out. 
I would swing on the zip wire and make it hot. <laughs> I just think he's a bit young. You're a bit young, so... Maybe, yeah. maybe. I love the concept. I love the business. I actually run probably the biggest craft retreat um, in the country, and it is hard work, really hard work. And 10 years we've slogged away at that and still haven't managed to, to make it make money. So I can't invest a day and I'm out. Sarah Davies knows all too well that the event business can be resource heavy, but profit light, and becomes the fourth dragon out. Deborah Meaden is the entrepreneur's last chance of investment, but also their favoured dragon. Has she heard anything to elicit an offer? So, guys, I really like it. Thank you. When I was in the holiday park industry, people coming in and providing a wow piece for my customers was absolute gold dust, you know. So I can clearly see what we could do with this. But there are some serious structural problems you've got ahead of you. And you need help. But I can offer help practically. I don't think I need to tell you, because I think you know full well what my background is. Yes. So I'm going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money, yep. and I want 25% of the business, which I think is a much more realistic valuation. Thank you. <laughs> Do you mind if we have a couple of minutes to I'm going to have a chat yep. behind the trees. Yeah, yeah exactly. In the woodland. Deborah Meaden thinks the festival idea has a real USP and tables a bid. Oh, obviously, Deborah's amazing. But I just think that we don't give away too much now. What do you think? But in return for the £75,000 the duo are seeking, she wants five times more than the 5% of equity that they're willing to give away. What do you think is a decent number to go? And it appears the pair have a new proposition to put to her. So, um, thank you very much for your offer. Um, we would like to ask if it would be possible to do 20%. And if we hit our numbers, which we believe we can, in the next season that we run, 315,000, would you be willing to roll back to the 5% that we pitched? 5%? No. That kind of misses the point, because if I'm having an impact on this business, then I'll be part of the you achieving your 315,000. I mean, it, yep, it, it's, illo it's completely illogical. So no is the answer. OK. Would you be willing to uh, do 20% for 75,000? Do you know, in your last counteroffer, I've got to tell you, I nearly fell off my chair. And that really worried me. I'm getting insights into how you are going to be when you go out there and you do business. And do you know what? I'm afraid I withdraw my offer. I'm out. OK. OK. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Lee and Julia must leave the den with nothing. Well, as a disgruntled Deborah Meaden takes the highly unusual step of curtailing the negotiations. I'm shocked you did that, but I'm not surprised at all. It was completely wrong thinking. We had discussed in advance that the maximum we wanted to give away was 10%, so to have an offer like 25% just felt like too high an offer to me. Yeah. It is a good product. Obviously, you hope to go in and get five offers, but, I mean, it's a negotiation. Sometimes negotiations don't work out. Next into the den are university pals turned business partners, Rebecca Joy and Natalie Deanna. Deep breath. We always knew that we were going to work together. There was something innate, I think, inside that we just knew we wanted to do that. 
We've just got an energy between us that we wanted to put into a company. It's a handbag. A vegan, non-leather handbag business. Been there. Came out very wounded. <laughs> But could there be more to Rebecca and Natalie's range of vegan-friendly fashion accessories than meets the eye? As far as we're aware, nobody else is putting erotic stories in handbags. Not only that, but we're managing to bring a luxury element to something that isn't animal leather. Hello, I'm Rebecca, and this is my business partner, Natalie. We're looking for £50,000 in exchange for a 10% share in our business, a conscious luxury vegan handbag brand, Frida Rome. Frida Rome was born out of a desire to create accessories for a new breed of consumers who want luxury but don't want to compromise on their ethics. All of our products are entirely vegan. They're made using progressive, eco-conscious materials and currently made in Britain. We are the brand for bad girls who do good things. We have a completely unique offering, as each of our bags contains an erotic story chapter. It's a great conversation starter and a little reminder of the rebel side of the woman who wears it. We launched our first product, the weekend handbag, Crossbody, in October 2020. In the first 30 days of its launch, we made £33,000. To date, we've sold nearly 300 weekend handbags in just seven months of trading. We hope to build a cult following of customers who want to engage with us beyond our products. Thank you for listening. We invite you to take a look at some of our products and we welcome your questions. Vegan handbags with an X-rated twist. It's made with cactus leather. Are the offering from Rebecca Joy and Natalie Deanna. It uniquely deconstructs so you can pack it flat, protect it. Who are seeking 50,000 pounds in return for a 10% share of their business. Said you. Rebecca and Natalie believe their product is unique. But will fashion mogul Tuka Suleiman view their new handbag as old hat? Ladies, um, I had a bag brand. Yep. Mm -hmm. I know a lot about bags. And there's nothing new about vegan bags. Mm -hmm. So explain to me what the material is made of that makes it progressive, eco-friendly, okay. as you said. So, historically, faux leathers that you would have seen out on the market were a lot of PVC. A lot of them used a lot of solvents in them. Where this particular leather sits in the market is what's known as more plant-based leathers, yep. made from cactus, as well as recycled cotton or recycled polyester backing on that particular material. So, it's not 100% sustainable, but you're going in the right direction. That's right. I can't help but open up and inside, you've got a message and it says, she looked up, beckoning him to take her. Still holding <laughs> onto his neck, she gripped him tighter. He came face to face with her and paused for the last time. And it goes on. It does. It does, yes. What's the idea behind that? Give me an idea. Me and Nat have been friends for a long time and we just have a certain energy between us and we're not particularly shy and we wanted to put something of us in the bag. Our personality. And we'd love to say it was more thought out, but Nat just said, we're going to put an erotic story in the bag and I'm going to write it. And I went, I love it. As I thought to myself as a customer, I would love to meet a brand that just took a bit of a difference, did something different. It's very different. Thank you. The handbag entrepreneur's left field USP appears to have intrigued Peter Jones. She's already an advocate of a plant-based lifestyle, but now Deborah Meaden wants to find out more about the duo's competition. Who are the main brands that you think you're competing against? It's been so difficult to find people that do something like this. Everything's very simple and French mm. and nice, which is also nice, but I don't want to buy them. I know what you mean, because I've actually been buying vegan bags for 15 years, but all of them, they're not quite right. Yeah. Well, I saw you smelling that bag as well. That's an interesting <laughs> thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we discovered cactus leather in 2019. Nobody knew about right. it then. We had samples of other fruit leathers, as you may, and they smell like fish. It's why I smelt them. I can smell a vegan bag a mile off, you know, it's, it's not good. Now, I love so much about this bag. However, I'm slightly puzzled by the erotic message. 
Only because sometimes you can say too much and it feels a little bit to me like this stands on its own. Mm -hmm. I have to say that I disagree. I look at this through a marketing lens, right? And I see so many cool products that have no brand story at all. But I think having some kind of compelling, provocative edge is going to be key, or else as a marketeer, I have nothing to work with. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about building a brand and not just a nice product? Well, we have a risque concept we wanted to go with, something that would potentially go viral. You know, you've got a woman there, dressed nice, maybe, you know, white shirt, you know, and she's sort of tapping a riding crop that ties into you, Deborah. I think you like horses, don't you? <laughs> Can I hear the story before you tie me into Fair it? enough, Thank yeah, you. yeah. I'll leave you out, I'll leave you out. <laughs> the camera zooms out and it reveals an entirely naked physical form of a man. And the tagline is, the only hide we're tanning this year or the only hide we're tanning this Christmas. So mm. it's a risque play on the fact that we're not using animal leathers. I've got vegan, I've got erotic, I've got adventurous. Is that kind of what you're going for? Yeah. If sex really does sell, then Rebecca and Natalie's near the knuckle marketing campaign could attract customers in their droves. But Sarah Davies is keen to discover just how big the pair feel their vegan handbags could actually be. Can you just talk me through the scale of the market opportunity that you feel like you've identified? Just give me a little bit of comfort around okay. that size of opportunity. In terms of vegan fashion, just the women's wear alone, in 2019, it reached a value of about 397 billion. But that's all fashion. Yes. We're talking about a subset of that, which yes. is just bags. Yes. We're talking about a subset of that, which is just this style of bag. Yep. And we're sub talking about a subset of that that like erotic novels. I mean, I love niche businesses. I've made my millions in niche businesses, but that is something else. But we like to think we have got something that is unique. The point that you think is gonna sell you above all else is... The erotic story. The erotic story. So what you get, it also makes it a collector's item. So you hopefully would get the whole collection and you'd have a different story every time. But then we're currently building a secret website where you get the whole story rather than just the chapter. Right. This whole business feels very, very self-indulgent. Huh. Not our intention. And my worry is you can go and be self-indulgent with your money, but with my 50 grand, no chance. I won't be investing. I'm out. OK. Rebecca and Natalie have lost their first dragon, as Sarah Davies fails to buy into their particular vision for the future of animal skin-free fashion. Tuka Suleiman has previous experience with a bag business, so will the sector-savvy dragon be tempted to offer up his cash? Ladies, I think you guys would be great to work with. Unfortunately, the bag market is a difficult market. Mm -hmm. And my experience, women either want a 30 pound or a 50 pound bag, or they want a thousand pound bag. That middle end struggles, especially when you're targeting a certain type of person. I'm looking for a return on my investment, and I can't see one here. So I'm out. Rebecca and Natalie, I really like the product. And I do see before me a nice, small, quite cottage-based boutique type of business, which is something to be proud of. The bigger, wider market attacking some of the premium brands, I think that that's going to take quite a lot of capital and investment to really get it going. And there's a nice story to it, and yet I'm not sure that it's going to give a decent enough return. So, I'm sorry, it's not something I'm going to invest in, so sadly I'm out. A second and third dragon have now declined the deal. Deborah Meaden may be Rebecca and Natalie's most natural investor, but do their products have sufficient X-factor 
to outweigh her reservations concerning their built-in sex factor. It's difficult for me because I love the bag, the design, the feel of it, that's lovely. But the erotic story for a big section, I think, is going to put them off. As a lot of vegans want to say, I am a stylish vegan. They don't want to shout, and I love Fifty Shades of Grey. And I actually don't disagree with Stephen, although he said he disagreed with me. I actually agree with the story. That is too much of a story for me. Mm -hmm. And that's put me off. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, but I won't be investing. I'm out. Four dragons down, and Rebecca and Natalie's hopes of securing an investment now hang by the slimmest of threads. Only Stephen Bartlett remains. So has the Sultan of Social Media spotted an opportunity his fellow dragons have missed? As a marketeer, especially in a saturated market, especially online, it's not enough just to have a good product, right? Mm -hmm. And my real expertise is understanding how to build a real cult following behind a brand and turn that into sales. Mm -hmm. And hopefully build tens of millions of followers online. And with you, I think I can see a story there to tell and one that would bring you closer to the brand. Yeah. And then I also like you two as entrepreneurs. Okay. I really do. And I think I'd enjoy working with you. So I am going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money for 20% of the business. We don't even need to discuss it, it because we'd to. love to work with you. And we'd you can take 20%. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Well, well done, guys. Well, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Success for Rebecca and Natalie, who leave the den with the £50,000 they were originally seeking, having bagged the backing of a dragon with the brand building expertise to take their business to a whole new level. I've got a very good feeling for Stephen. As a person, I think he embodies the same ethics as we do and energy. I can see the headline now, Stephen Bartless invests in erotic handbag business. <laughs> I think we can build a really, really cool culturally relevant brand over a long period of time. I put money on the fact you'll be appearing in the advert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to crack open a few bottles of champagne. Vegan friendly <laughs> champagne, here we go. Also hoping to set corks popping was London-based Tom Durse. A full-sized house turned upside down to serve as a backdrop for social media-friendly snaps was the proposal. Really wish I hadn't had that drink this morning. <laughs> Dear Dragons, hi. Upside Down House is a unique inverted photo attraction that mixes the old with the new and implements social media. We're looking for £160,000 for 5% equity within our business. Tom had brought along a room to demonstrate, and Deborah Meaden was first to strike a pose. Look for it, Deborah. <laughs> That's it. There you go. Yeah. So, rotate the photo, and they're upside down. That's how I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> when it came to getting a feel for the business's finances, Sarah Davies wasn't hanging around. Can I dig into the numbers? Since launch, we've had a turnover of 1.34 million and 73,000 pound net. So you've made 73 grand. So how on earth do you get to a valuation of 3.2 million? Based on the potential, based on... on... I think it's a crystal ball. Tuka Suleiman thought he'd found a way to improve Tom's profits by getting rid of his overheads. Maybe what you should be doing, Tom. Yes. Taking that, going to some department stores, got plenty of space, set it up, charge £10 a shot, no planning control, no nothing, right? Yep. I don't think that's a bad idea, actually. I do. I think it's a really bad idea. There's no way on earth you can charge a millennial 10 quid for that. I just put a figure up on my head. But all I'm saying to you is, hopefully I've given you some inspiration for yourself. Yes, you have. But potential relocation aside, the Den's Instagram impresario, Stephen Bartlett, 
was concerned that the rewards for an investment could hit a definite ceiling. I think this is a bit of a one-trick pony business, and I think that your return rate of customers will be somewhere below 2%. Because if I've been once and I've taken the photos, it's insanity to go back to the same set again. So for that reason, I'm going to say that I'm out. Thank you so much. Tom's business proposition may have failed to click. Three, two, one. But the dragons couldn't resist the chance <laughs> to grab a quirky snap. Right, next. Yeah, you look ridiculous. The pandemic has presented unprecedented challenges for some businesses and opportunities for others. One sector to benefit has been home food delivery. And now, hoping to take on-demand delivery to the next level, are Birmingham-based business partners, Zach Lloyd and Aaron Branch. Let's do this. What makes our offering special is that there is a USP which our competitors don't currently have. Got your back, bro. We feel that this is a global product and we really see it everywhere around the whole world. Hello Dragons, my name is Zach, I'm the founder of Deliver Me and this is my co-director Aaron Branch. We are here today to pitch for £50,000 investment into our on-demand delivery app Deliver Me. We want to make it possible to order anything, anytime, anywhere for the spontaneous, the vulnerable and those of us that experience life's little emergencies. Using our prepaid card technology, we were looking to disrupt the on-demand delivery market by diversifying what is available on the platform away from just food, also including technology and pharmaceuticals. We also have a verified store program which allows us to partner with independent stores and allows them to offer anything for the consumer. Ahead of our launch next month, we are looking at utilising the 725 riders, couriers and drivers that we have onboarded successfully already. We would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to pitch our app and would welcome any questions. What percent of 50 grand? 8%, sorry. 8%? 8%. Do apologise. An on-demand delivery app that allows customers to obtain any product from any store is the offering from Zach Lloyd and Aaron Branch, who are seeking £50,000 in return for an 8% share in their business. Sarah Davies is first in the queue to order up some answers. Guys, so the idea is if I'm at home on my own with a newborn baby and they've got a nappy rash and I need specific nappy rash cream, you go and find it for me. Yes. And what you've just described is literally my life the past three months. So <laughs> as a new parent, I've literally been in circumstances I've never anticipated being in where <laughs> panic has erupted. Yep. I've got baby in arm. There's no way my family or friends can help. I can't put him while he's kicking and screaming into the car. It's just an impossible situation. All right, all right. This is not a therapy session, OK? <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, OK. I'll stop right there. What's your professional background? So um, I'm 21. At a young age, seven and nine, I lost my parents, both of them. So that really propelled me into trying to make money and you know stand on my own feet. So at school, I used to sell sweets, and then I moved into doing phone repairs. And then from there, I've always had this idea, just needs the right people behind us. And I'm running a direct response social media agency. We've got 15 team members at present. Last year, we turned over £530,000. Pretty impressive. So this idea, I remember first seeing it in San Francisco eight, nine years ago. Yes. yes. In the UK, there are other players in this space currently trying to do exactly this. The other day, I managed to get medicine at 3 a.m. in London on delivery. So where does your business stand within that context? I've seen the competitors in the US do it really well, and it's a very similar model, so I know it works. Other apps have tried this, but they still require a relationship with that vendor. We don't, because we're the first ones with the prepaid card side. It allows us to scale a lot faster than the other competitors out there. In a crowded market, 
Zach and Aaron believe their use of prepaid card technology could give them a valuable edge over the competition. Now, telecom's titan, Peter Jones, is keen to discover more about how exactly the pair plan to profit from their app. How does your model work? Because I'm assuming if I want to buy a set of nappies, you, are you putting on a margin on top of those nappies for you or are you just charging me a delivery cost? So we have a delivery fee, £1.50 for pickup and drop off. And we also have a service fee of £1 per mile. If I go on there and think, do you know what? My phone's just broken. I want you to go and pick me up a £1,000 phone. I pay that through your site. Yeah. Yep. You're then crediting the driver with the prepayment and then it could take him an hour by the time he queues up mm -hmm. or she queues up and then deliver it to me. But I'm still within a two mile radius, but you've now spent an hour and you've only charged me a fixed fee, which doesn't even cover the cost of the person doing the collection and delivery. How can you make money at that level? We want to have our drivers placed at the stores already in the hotspots where they can access the widest variety of products for our customers. But even in a specific location to get this Mm -hmm. to a scale that actually becomes exciting. You're going to have to throw a lot of cash at this and be prepared to lose money as you roll this out. I agree, yeah. We've definitely taken that into account. How much? We estimate 15 million to roll out. How much? 15 million. Whoa. News of a multi-million pound rollout cost has set alarm bells ringing in the den. Deborah Meaden wants to pin down exactly what Zach and Aaron believe their business can really offer its potential customers. Guys, do you really think you're a delivery service or do you think you're a shopping service? Great point. We actually have coined the phrase of having us as your personal shopper. That is the difference. You know, somebody is shopping for you. However, the reason that starts getting really complicated is when you're actually shopping for somebody, you know, it could be standing at the till for hours, product isn't there, got to go to another shop, deliver it to me, I've got the wrong product, it's taken me hours, it's, you know, it just feels like the customer service on this is going to be a nightmare. I think you've developed a very, very simple model and you've overlaid it with an awful lot of failure points or points that could fail and that makes it really hard for me to invest. I'm sorry, guys, I won't be. I'm out. Zach and Aaron have lost their first dragon, as Deborah Meaden identifies potential issues with their chosen business model. Tuka Suleiman, meanwhile, has been mulling over the implications of the pair's eight-digit funding requirements. Guys, um, a lot of companies raise a lot of money and they burn the money and say, if only we could start again. You're fortunate. You're just beginning. And I think you, know, you should lock yourselves away, have a strategy today, <laughs> rethink the model. The proposal that you've come in with today, for me, is definitely not investable, guys. I'm out. My big worry is if there was this much of an opportunity, mm -hmm. one of the incumbents in the market at the moment would do it, or yeah. one of the successful people executing this in the US would roll this out into Europe. So I'm sorry, I can't invest and I'm out. Looking at this as an investment opportunity is really, really hard. What you should have done if you want to move into this market, this should be shopforyou.com so that the consumer knows exactly what you're about. This is about shopping for you. Mm -hmm. You'll have to rethink this model really quickly. But for an investor sitting here now, this is definitely not an opportunity. If I was to invest 50K, I would expect that to go in the first week. So I'm out. Four dragons down. Only Stephen Bartlett now remains. Does he believe that Zach and Aaron have devised the potential app of choice for home delivery devotees in Birmingham and beyond? How are you feeling following all of that feedback from my fellow dragons here? I think all the feedback is good feedback. 
It's been great for us. I think because we're at a point where we're very agile and we can adapt and change. That's really good to hear. I think you're good guys. The way you presented today and your humility and self-awareness, highly, highly respectable. And I really deeply hope that you don't walk out of here and then carry on yeah. with your plan to launch in the near term, because right now you are running towards a blazing inferno. No, and I don't want to be burned. I wish you the very, very best, but I'm going to say that I'm out. Thanks for all the feedback. We will take it on board. Thank you. Take care. Sadly for Zach and Aaron, they must leave the den with nothing other than advice. No. <laughs> but even though they're heading down empty handed, loved it. That was great. Feedback. Learn a lot. Their mood most definitely isn't going in the same direction. We needed that, you know, multimillionaires to look at this business and see the flaws. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to receive that feedback. And I feel like we've got some really good ideas to go and think about. Are you having a drink? Just want a bit more. Yeah, go on. Last into the den, a Rochdale-based Karen and Andy Turner. Being married and being in a business partnership, a lot of people it creates conflict, but with, with us, it, it doesn't tend to. We bounce ideas off each other all the time. We do, yeah. yeah. Andy comes up with ideas and I say no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Whatever, so we're not even in there yet. <laughs> oh, sweets. Oh, gosh, no. Are they sweets that looks like seeds or rice, lentils? As first-time business owners, Karen and Andy's initial foray into the world of commerce has had its challenges. Here we go. We're accidental entrepreneurs, really. My background's childcare, so it has been a learning curve for me, definitely. Mum's the slaughter. <laughs> Hello, dragons. My name's Karen, this is my husband, Andy, and together we're here today to ask for £50,000 for 20% of our business, Candy Kitchen Creations Limited. In 2017, we went on holiday to Canada and we visited some local markets and we were struck by food products that were stacked in layers, sand art style. Inspired, we came back and developed our first few packs on the kitchen table. We booked into some markets and the feedback was really, really positive. Today, we've got 20 varieties of soup, stew and risotto. They're super simple to make, and many just need two and a half to three pints of water. We have 11 puddings as well, and they're also really tasty. We have over 40 garden centres, delis, and farm shops stocking the product throughout the UK. We also continue to sell via our website and going to events, markets, etc and we hope you're hungry because we've uh, got some samples of our coconut curried lentil soup, uh, Lakeland ginger shortbread um, and chocolate brownies. So who fancies being a soup dragon? Oh. <laughs> boom, boom! Absolutely. <laughs> a range of attractively packaged soups, stews and risottos... I feel a bit like Mrs Overall. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ..plus selected desserts is the offering from Karen and Andy Turner. How does this work? You literally just put it in a pan and add your water. Who are seeking £50,000 in return for a 20% share in their ready-made meal business. I very rarely eat in the den, but this is exceptional. Thank you. My word, now there's a compliment. That is massive. <laughs> <laughs> Karen and Andy appear to have tickled Tuka Suleiman's taste buds. But will Sarah Davies demonstrate an appetite to invest? Andy, Karen, great innovative concept. So are you putting these together by hand? Yeah, everything's done by hand. However, we have recently invested in some weighing machinery, which will speed up the process quite significantly. Brilliant. So, when did you say you started the business? 2017. Do you want to talk me through each, each year's each number year, so we yeah. get a feel? So 2017-18, we sold 508 packs, which was £2,000, with a net profit of £195. Yep. 18-19, 
We sold £12,000 worth with a net profit of £850. 1920, 32,000 with a net profit of four. And 2021, that was 40,000 with a net profit of 8,000. You know, this deserves more credit than your figures. Because the figures show that, you know, for some reason it hasn't worked in what I call a bigger business. Yeah. So next year, what would be your turnover? We were looking at about 90,000. Mm -hmm. And net profit? About 20%. It's 20,000, say? Yeah. So with this new machinery, yeah. how many of those can you make a week? I think around the three to 4,000 mark. So basically, 4,000, um, average price of what? Everything is five pounds each. So next year, in full capacity going forward, you could do a million pounds? Yes. Having already given their product a big thumbs up on taste, Tuka Suleiman has identified plenty of scope to increase production. Now, Deborah Meaden wants to find out more about how the pair devised their unusual moniker. So why candy kitchen? Because that kind of makes you think sweets. It was a, a piece of marketing genius, Karen, Andy. Candy. Why say Karen and Andy when I can just say candy? Sometimes it does cause confusion and that's why we've gone down the super simple branding for the product. OK. But not only does it call itself Candy Kitchen, but it actually looks quite sort of sherbety. How attached are you to your branding? We've changed it three times in the last year, uh, yeah. following feedback. I wrote down, when you were pitching, I wrote down, that's a food tube. <laughs> so I thought, actually, the brand really, for me, is like, it's the food. <laughs> that, for me, it does what it says on the tin. Can I say, I think food is rubbish, but I think the thing you said before... <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I can say that, because <laughs> I just said it. But I tell you what I do like. I like what you said, first of all. Uh, tube. Food tube. I think food that's tube. great. All right, well, let's go food tube, then. OK. So, what is your dream? You know, when you talk about those big, massive orders, it stops being the thing that you're doing at the moment. My dream is to sit in the office watching the, the millions make it <laughs> for me. Um, and it being out there on the shelves in, you know, in maybe supermarkets in, in a few years' time, because they are selling, they're selling really well. It's just getting it through that door. For the ready-made meal entrepreneurs, winning supermarket shelf space holds out the promise of lucrative returns. Though a social media savvy Stephen Bartlett believes that the pair could be overlooking other potential routes to market. I think this is probably a direct-to-consumer business more so than you realise. How much of your revenue is coming from online? 15 to 18% online. Is that your website? Yes, direct on website. But we know that's a big area that we can develop. I was assuming the reason why you haven't tapped the direct-to-consumer market and the social media opportunities because it's maybe not in your skill set? It is definitely. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. And obviously We're not being... complete technos. Okay. We can work a computer, we have Facebook, we have Instagram. You know, if you could get influencers to do a couple of Instagrams about this, showing how quickly and easy it is to use yeah. this to make great food, I think you could sell hundreds of thousands. Absolutely. The actual online side of things, that is definitely an area that we need to develop. But we were saying the other week, an influencer, you know, it's from a different generation. An influencer was the guy who got your telly back when it got nicked on your council last day in my day. <laughs> <laughs> Karen and Andy's idea of an influencer might have more to do with nicking than clicking, but the pair appear refreshingly open to new avenues for attracting custom. From sauces to sausages, Peter Jones is no stranger to success in the food sector. So can he see this pair's products making a big splash with the supermarkets? I can see it on the shelves, actually. I think that's the right proposition. I really, really like it. Wow. <laughs> I had some brownies this week made by Sarah. And she's going to be really upset. But yours are better. 
Wow. Wow. Do you know what? But I really love partnering with really genuinely great people that deserve a break. And you've come up with a cracking idea, and I'm not even sure you know how good it is. So, because of all of those things, I'm going to make you an offer. Thank you. However, there is a but. This is definitely a journey for two dragons. Because I think you need a lot of support. That's why I'm going to offer you half of the money, £25,000, for 16.75% because that would mean that if I was to partner with any one of the remaining dragons, we would have 33 and a third percent of a third of the business. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. An offer from Peter Jones, albeit one that requires another dragon to match it. It's going to be a bit embarrassing if no one wants to be your friend, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Will Sarah Davies be willing to buddy up and make a bid? My worry is this looks and feels like a smashing family business. And I worry that having an investor on board, all of a sudden, investors come with a huge level of expectation. That's going to drive you really hard. And in my heart, that doesn't feel right. Hmm. I can't invest a day and I'm out. I think the unique value, the interesting thing here is that you can see into the bags. And anyone can do that. This isn't to take away from the business you have, but it does pose a big risk to me if this were to become at all interesting to any incumbent that sells pastas and sachets with all the ingredients included, just to reorganize the packaging in a different way to make it a little bit more compelling. I congratulate you for what you've done today, but um, I'm going to say that I'm out. Disappointment for Karen and Andy, as a duo of dragons decline the deal. They already have a partial offer from Peter Jones, so will Deborah Meaden be prepared to join him in redeeming readies for ready meals? There's lots of reasons why this is a great business. And you guys are a lot to do with that. But you are going to need help, you know. It is going to need a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and two dragons in this instance could be better than one. So, yeah, I, I would be happy to go on this journey and offer you half of the money, so that's 25,000, for if my calculations are right. 16.75% <laughs> or as near as damn it. Well, thank you. Thank you. The den's two longest serving dragons combine to make Karen and Andy a viable offer. £50,000 in return for a third of their business. Only Tuka Suleiman is yet to declare his hand. Is he planning to stir the pot by chucking in some cash of his own? I love the fact that you've created something that probably is a little jewel that you don't really know what you've got. I know that Deborah wants it, I know Peter wants it, and I want it. I know sometimes three is too many, but there's a lot of work here to be done. If Deborah and Peter agree, but I'm willing to pay a third for 11%. Thank you, Sika. Thank you. Peter and Deborah, <laughs> is, it, is it a no or is it a yay? Do you know what? I think this is one where you could easily have three dragons. Not many times did I ever say that. Mm. I agree. I mean, I in this instance, I think it could really help catapult this business. So what that would mean is, if we were to partner the three of us, we would invest £16,667 each for 11% of the business. Yeah. Each. Can we go and have a chat? I don't think we need to, do Sorry? we? Do we need to? No. No. We don't need to. <laughs> I like you. You don't mess around, do you? She, she's the boss, isn't she? She's the boss. We'd love to accept, thank you. Excellent. 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 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dragons. Do you like the food tube as a brand? Hate it. <laughs> They might not see eye to eye over a rebrand. Right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Well thank done. You. But when it comes to striking a deal, investors and entrepreneurs are in perfect harmony. Karen and Andy leave the den with the £50,000 they were originally seeking and a dragon triumvirate with the cash, contacts, and credibility to supercharge their soups business. Oh, my word. I think I've just upset Mr. Jones. <laughs> I'd be excited to take that home and make it. Yeah. The food tube for the lazy chef. Yeah. You should have got your third for free for all the marketing insight. And three dragons. Take you on the gin tonight. Definitely. <laughs> to actually see what we've planned for the last three, four years is actually going to come into fruition. Yeah. Amazing. It's incredible. A heart as well as a stomach warming conclusion to the day's business as Karen and Andy Turner convince a trio of dragons to invest in their homemade soups and stews. Their business might take time to come to the boil, but with Peter Jones, Deborah Mead, and, and Tuka Suleiman all on board, the couple certainly have all the right ingredients for success. <laughs> Next time. I'm going to ask for something that I've never heard asked for in the den before. Have you got your lucky underpants on? Every business needs somebody in the background to clear up the dog poo. Whoa! I'm a single 28-year-old guy trying to find a girlfriend. My daughter's out the back. That's a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. Boy, do I feel for you. You are the most credible 24-year-old that's ever walked through those doors. <laughs> that was a moment. Ooh, Tuka, they want you. Yeah, I know. Where might a successful dragon fly off on holiday? How about inside Dubai, playground of the rich? Watch now on iPlayer. Here on BBC One, a recipe for success or disaster. It all comes out in the boardroom. The Apprentice, next.